as we uh, dive deeper into the book of Acts. And uh, again, thanks for uh, just uh, walking together through this series. Uh, again, there's Bibles available if you need them. I encourage you to bring your Bible as we walk through the book of Acts. And we're going through chapter 14. Uh, so chapter 14, we're already just cruising through this book. And um, just a, a quick reminder too, is there are study guides. I forget to re-emphasize this from time to time, but we do have study guides that are always out in the entry area. And so if there's something like, why didn't Pastor John talk about this particular thing or <laughs> this section? And some of the small groups, I, I believe, may be using it as well for their Bible studies. But if you ever want to pick one up, uh, keep the several copies in the back. And they're also in the notes on the, uh, on the website and I believe to uh, the Thursday newsletter. So uh, more information if you want to do some more study on that. Um, as we uh, go through the theme for today, our, our, the emphasis is on the Christian life in three dimensions in chapter 14. And if you think back the last couple of weeks, um, or just last week, we went through two full chapters. It was a lot, 12 and 13, and there was kind of a big corner turned as uh, Paul and Barnabas are venturing out and bringing the good news of the gospel to all the earth. And all languages, all people, Jews, Gentiles... And this is just awakening is happening, and there's conversions, and, and this man, a centurion of all people, is converted to, and comes to faith in Christ, and, and there's some persecution as well that's being faced, and even imprisonment and miraculous escapes, and, um, and we see now that, that uh, Saul, or Paul, and Barnabas uh, are undeterred, and they are traveling. Uh, they are on these journeys to the region of the world that they were living in and bringing the good news of Jesus. So journeys, traveling. Okay, that brings us to our question of the day about traveling by car. And uh, to think about, uh, I guess this is, a, you know, as we think about Memorial Day and the, they call it the unofficial start of summer, right? And everybody's jetting off somewhere perhaps for the weekend or a lot of people are and, you know, talk about all the AAA gives their statistics on how many will be traveling this year more than last year, of course, and all that. But, um, you know, you always got to be careful out there on the road, just letting you know as if we don't know that. But uh, um, the question was, have you ever been in a car accident? And then was it your fault or the other person's fault? And I have three instances where it was clearly the other person's fault. <laughs> but I was thinking about this, and a couple of them came to mind. One was uh, actually uh, my first job out of college was being an admissions counselor for this small Bible college I went to. And I was going down to uh, Vancouver. So the college was in Seattle, and I was going down to Vancouver, Washington. And... Uh, uh, and it was on this wet road. It was very wet. See, it was the road's fault. <laughs> uh, and uh, I was uh, driving and going down this ramp, the exit ramp. And well, okay, let's be real here. I didn't put on the brakes quite soon enough. And I had to stop. It was a little bit of a sudden slowdown. And my car just stopped just in time, but it just barely tapped the person's bumper in front of me. And all I remember seeing, <laughs> it's kind of comical, but kind of sad too, but this woman had like a cup of coffee with like without a lid. And all I remember seeing was the cup of coffee went up and she stormed out of the car and just poured the rest of the coffee on my car. And I go, oh man, I'm going to jail. I'll probably never drive again. You know, I'm not, it's over. Uh, and actually we exchanged, you know, the information, but never heard anything of it. So yeah, just nothing happened. Okay. Second time, uh, these are a little more like oh, embarrassing, but uh, when we lived up in Bremerton, and we were driving out of our very narrow driveway, backing out from my garage, and my wife parked the car right where she was supposed to, but I didn't, wasn't paying attention, and I barely backed out into her car. But it was an all-state to all-state insurance collision, so that was okay. It worked out well. It dings your insurance, but it got fixed. And then the other time, I was in, uh, this was down in Southern California, in Irvine, we were at this park, and it, again, it wasn't my fault. <laughs> it was these planter boxes that had gotten planted there, and I, right, right, right when I was leaving, they must have put it there right when I was driving out, backing up, and it was just high enough to hit our minivan's back window, and I backed up, didn't see it, you know, it was, it was just right at that level, it was like in my blind spot or something, right? It wasn't my fault. <laughs> And backed up and just shattered the window. All the kids were in the car and oh, shattered the back window and spooked us, but everybody was fine. Now, on a 
More serious note, uh, Kelly's our Facebook host. Thanks, Kelly, for hosting our people online there, too. Uh, she, she gave me a huge rundown. I can only give it a little snapshot. But she was driving in back of a school bus. And you know how school buses stop, and then they stop again, and then they stop again, and stop before they should stop, you think? You know? uh, well, she said she was, she was, this is real honest, true confession here. She was texting and driving, and ding, hit the school bus, and... Or the car in front. Anyway, I can't remember all that she said. But anyway, it was like, my bad. And she even admitted, the guy that was an attorney that was nearby, she admitted, I was texting and driving. It's all my fault. He goes, never say that. (laughs) (laughs) But Kelly, bless her heart, honest as honest could be, right? And uh, uh, anyway, nothing ever came of it because it just did the cash, paid for the car. It wasn't the bus that was dinged. It was the car in front of her. Anyway, but uh, any other, anybody else, like, have any moments, like, through confessions like Pastor John, or I know some have probably been through, and I know I've, I've talked with a few of you who have been through some life and death accidents. That's a serious, serious matter. But uh, y'all, anybody else resonate with that? Car was totaled. Car was totaled. Yeah. Like, Wow. Wow. So just totaled your car, huge collision, but you were unscathed. Wow. Wow. Okay. I didn't see a stop sign. You didn't see it. See, they popped it up right, right in front of you. Ouch. T boned by a county maintenance truck. Station wagon became a compact. Ouch. But nobody was hurt. Okay. So, okay, one more. It was a dark, rainy night. Dark and stormy night. (laughs) Back down in my brother-in-law's trash can, I drive over for daylight, I back into his trash can. I've got three mirrors and a camera on that car, and I still hit the trash can. (laughs) Backing out and just hit that trash can head on. Another true confession. Thank you, Dave. Well, okay, we could go on on this, but I guess the focus when we're driving needs to be on driving, doesn't it? Not other things, paying very close attention to the surroundings, whether it's wet outside, snowy, uh, traffic, etc. And let's all admit these phones are from the devil, okay, (laughs) especially when they are used to we used while you're driving, and we got to all remember that to put them aside, and don't let the don't let Satan tempt you to text and drive. Okay, let's just say. But um, thinking more deeply on this, a focus today. Um, the the world around us demands our attention, doesn't it? In different ways, just really seeks to grab our attention, whether it's media, news, advertising, billboards. Sports, uh, entertainment, everything screams, watch me, you know, look at me, uh, gets your attention. Maybe even, you know, obviously trying to get us to buy something we maybe really probably don't even need. But a uh, question, who and what are we paying attention to? And so uh, Paul and Barnabas, these new lands never before had been, and they're traveling around. What would be their just, just focus, their laser focus as they continued on in their mission. Lots of things that were distracting, right? Even persecution itself, being put in jail. And you'll see more threats on their lives today. But um, as there's the mission of Jesus moves outside of Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, there's new challenges, new things that require attention. What do we focus on? And I think these will be good reminders for all of us. Three dimensions, the Christian life in three dimensions, okay? Upward to God by the power of the Holy Spirit, Outward, our mission to our culture, being engaged with the world, and then inward, uh, edifying and building up one another, building up the community of faith, right, to the church, God's family. So uh, just like drivers, right, balancing your focus, right? You got got three things. You got the, well, more than this, but you got the road, you got your rear view mirror, you got your side mirrors, right? Let's kind of keep this focus, these, these three dimensions, right, upward. Uh, outward and inward, and we'll talk about these three. So first of all, upward, Jesus' followers are empowered by the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to read verses 1 through 7 of uh, chapter 14. 
At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went, as usual, into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So Paul and Barnabas were, spent considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed the message of His grace by enabling them to do miraculous signs and wonders. The people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews, others with the apostles. There was a plot afoot among the Gentiles and Jews together with their leaders to mistreat them and stone them. But they found out about it and they fled to the Lyconian cities of Lystra and Derbe and to the surrounding country where they continued to preach the good news. And uh, this context of this uh, chapter 14 as it starts is it's set with the previous verse at the end of chapter 13 where it says the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit, uh, even in the midst of the persecution that they'd faced in the previous region. Okay, filled with what? Joy and the Holy Spirit. And that's what led them down then into these next, uh, next areas. Um, they're they go on to Iconium, to this city. And they, uh, as usual, in, chapter, in verse 1 of 14, it says they entered the Jewish synagogue. That was normal. They spoke then to the people. They were speaking to the audience that they knew and, and, and uh, speaking in such a way, too, as the word got out, both Jews and Greeks believed. And uh, uh, so as we think about this, again, where there's a Jewish people... Uh, right, and the fulfillment of the scriptures, these were the first ones to really catch on and receive, oh, this is what was, who God spoke about through the scriptures, through the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, the one who's fulfilled the scriptures. And so, but eventually it goes out not just to Jews, but to Gentiles also, Greeks, others. And then it says, though, here comes trouble again. It says, unbelieving Jews stirred up trouble in verse 2. Um, so all this is happening, and these Jewish people that were in all these places outside of Jerusalem were there as a result of the what they call the diaspora or the dispersion of a Jewish people of generations past that had these Jewish communities all over the world, synagogues, and that's where these uh, these apostles like uh, like uh, Paul uh, and others would go and preach the word first, but then go out to all the people to the to the uh, Jews and Greeks. Um, so just remember that this is the Holy Spirit that is empowering them, enabling them to do more than they could ever do on their own. This isn't just their eloquence and human wisdom. It's God, and it's the Holy Spirit speaking through them. Uh, Holy Spirit empowerment. And even as they do these signs and wonders, I, th I believe it's all a part of God's plan in this, especially in this early church where there's trouble that's stirred up. So God says, I'm going to work even greater things. They're going to preach. They're going to speak the message of Jesus, but I'm also going to enable them to do these signs and wonders that we speak, that we saw. Um, they spent considerable time there, even in the midst of the stirring up of, of hatred and anger against them. Uh, it says in verse three, speaking boldly, uh, for the Lord who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to do miraculous signs and wonders. Right there in verse 3. And why was that? Well, the, always remember there's a purpose. And the purpose of these signs and wonders isn't for their glory, uh, for anyone else other than pointing people to faith. And God used this time and this high tension packed time and, and gave these beautiful signs and wonders of healing to point people to the message of God's grace in Jesus. No, nothing else, no one else. And just we confirm that. I mean, even in Jesus' words in John 15, we remember that the role of the Holy Spirit, yes, is to point people to Jesus. In John 15, 26 says, When the counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. So that was the promise of the Holy Spirit, that he would testify and tell about Jesus. And again, this message was sometimes received, sometimes not. Um, and it went to all people, not about ethnicity, not about nationality, but it's about faith. And um, just 
they, they, Paul and Barnabas, they're, they're, they're smart, they're, they're careful, they're thoughtful, um, they use practical wisdom, and so when these heavy, heavy death threats come, sometimes they stick around for a while, but also sometimes it's, it's time, and God points them, go in a different direction. Okay, you know, it's kind of that, you know, wipe the dust off your feet there and move on to the next town, even as Jesus did, um, going in a different direction, uh, using wisdom and trust, just not going to stop them from preaching. They just move on. So uh, just again, think on that thought. The Holy Spirit is empowering these first believers, enabling them to do signs and wonders, things that were beyond them, beyond us. And uh, I, I want to pause there for a moment uh, as we think about Paul and, and uh, his followers moving on. But um, think about the Holy Spirit's empowerment in your life. And you might think, well, Pastor John, I've never performed a miracle, and, or maybe you have, or I've never, I don't know if any, there's anything that dynamic about me, but there is. And uh, we point out oftentimes people that we look out in, in our, whether it's in our own community or in the world, and we think about people that have really amazing gifts, right? Maybe there's someone that you've heard that's just a great, uh, uh, you know, a motivational speaker type of person. You've heard them, or an author that you've read, and you think, wow, they're just super gifted. You know, authors like Max Lucado or, or others that can just write like nobody's business and just really powerful stuff. It's like, wow, I could just sit and listen to this guy all day and go to a conference or something like that. Or there's other people with gifts of, uh, like, athletic abilities, right? You name the sport, there's always somebody that rises to the top, right? Natural ability, and they've worked hard at it. It's like, wow, I'll never get there. And, and we can always point out musicians or other people that think like, wow, they got, God's given them all these gifts and abilities. But all of us, you and me, all of us have gifts, have talents, have abilities. And remember, a person's like natural uh, gifts and abilities, even those people that seem to have everything, they only can go so far. And let's admit it, I think, uh, you know, Drew, you've been in, a, in tennis, uh, just wrapped up your tennis season, right? And he was the district champion uh, at, uh, at Newburgh High School and made it to the state tournament. Um, I think about uh, others, too, that have been competing recently. We've got several kids from our, uh, our, our, our church here, um, the Smiths, and some of those guys in the state tournaments and stuff like that, Davy Sanders. But there's always somebody a little better, right? <laughs> there's always, you can rise to the level, but then you always meet. And that's, this is in the pro-life, too, wherever you're at, right? There's always somebody. Oh, man. Rise up, rise up. So, uh, and even that person's natural abilities will only take them so far. Even that great kid that won the state tournament, right? I don't know, is it over now, You're, the state tournament? Who's the kid that won the state tennis? Sophomore from Lincoln. Sophomore from Lincoln. Well, there's somebody better than him out there, <laughs> right? Great player, too. Right? So, um, but when we, as Christians, whether, whatever God's gifted us with, our abilities, as we trust in Jesus... Repenting of our sins, believing that Jesus died, he rose again, and, and believing and trusting that as I trust in him and as I believe, that gift of the Holy Spirit is in me, taking up residency in me, enabling me to do things outside of my own ability, and takes your own abilities and multiplies them, right, to give glory and honor to Jesus. However great or small that might seem in the world's eyes, everybody's important, um, think about this. Now, so I'll pick on Chuck for a moment here. So this is a little commercial for Chuck and his audit team, okay? <laughs> so, uh, ooh, that's a glorious position to be the audit team, isn't it? All, everybody wants to be on the audit team, right, Chuck? Oh, yeah. Administrating stuff and looking at numbers. I just hate to turn people down. I hate to turn people down. Yeah, he's got a waiting list of people that want to be on his team. No, seriously. I don't, do you still need people? Do you still need people? You bet. Okay. So there's an example. Well, okay, it doesn't seem all glamorous, just kind of sounds boring, administration and stuff like that. But, well, it's a, it's a gift, you know, an ability that God's given you. And when you put it to work for God's kingdom, it's a spiritual gift in this, right? And the Holy Spirit takes it and we use it to serve Jesus. All the stuff that people do, that you do here at Community of Hope, that are like an audit team behind the scenes, what if it wasn't there? What if all these, all these little or big things weren't there? Everything kind of disintegrates, unravels. So when the 
Well, that's the power of the Holy Spirit, and that's how those gifts can become just used for the kingdom purposes and multiplied as we invite him in. So I want us to remember that as we think, oh, Paul, Barnabas, all these great super-duper superstars of the faith and miracles and signs. Well, that's the Holy Spirit in them. That's the Holy Spirit in you. And God uses all those gifts. And uh, uh, just praying that God would make us the kind of church that truly engages with the Holy Spirit. Great things, miracles, signs and wonders that can be done or sweeping and vacuuming and prepping the place for worship the next morning or something like that. Whatever it is, it's, it's, it can be used for God's kingdom purposes. Okay, so there's our first uh, segment, upward, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Secondly, outward, Jesus' followers are engaged with the culture. And I'm going to pick out a few sections of verses or verses from verses uh, 8 through 20. So if you have your Bibles open, you'll see that they are moving on uh, in Lystra. And there's a man, it says, who's crippled in his feet, lame from birth, had never walked, uh, listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed, and called out, stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. God's using, again, these, these gifts, these signs and wonders to direct people to Jesus. Um, and I think as, as they go to, from town to town, remember this, the gospel of Jesus is beyond adaptable. Okay? It relates to people and cultures of all time. And we've seen that from the early church to today. The gospel comes in to people and there's, so, there's always a way that the gospel relates and connects with people in their, in their culture and their time. So this miracle is performed, this man is healed, able to walk now. And uh, that's what happens when Jesus' followers come in contact with others, miracles. And that greatest miracle of all is the miracle of faith, as they come in contact with the culture and the world around us. And may God use us, too, to bring, being able to use that, him to, by his Holy Spirit, to create the miracle of faith in the lives of others. And uh, as, they, as this miracle, it's interesting, as this miracle in verse uh, uh, 11 and following is received by the people... They hear him just chattering in this Lycan, Lyconian language. So they're like in another place, and they're, what are they saying? Maybe it's they can catch a few words here and there, maybe not much. But uh, they wonder what's going on. And, and these people there are trying, after they see this miracle, it says they're trying to make them like, you're a god. They're telling them, you're gods. You're like, you're like these elevated gods that they, we, we want to worship now. So they're trying to like bow down and worship these guys. And, uh, and they figure this out. Um, uh, this says Barnabas in verse 12. Barnabas they called Zeus. <laughs> and Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. Um, and uh, they, they're starting to like make sacrifices to them. And uh, they figure it out. What's going on here? And they say, stop this. We are people. We're just men. We are not quote-unquote gods. And this is a very different reaction if you remember the sad story of last week where the King Herod of the day was like receiving it like, oh, King Herod, you're a god. And he instead of saying, no, 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 I'm not a god. He liked that. And uh, what happened when he just received that and like believed, you know, what do they say you um, believe what's written about, believe the press. Anyway, believe what's written about, yeah, I, 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 I am a God, and well, he died really fast in a horrible way. So don't ever say it, you're a God. <laughs> Let's just say. Um, so this, this reaction is interesting, and, and uh, gods and goddesses in the Greek world, as you can think about all the mythology and everything, they live up high on these mountains and sometimes show up and do mighty things, and if you mistreat them, if you mistreat the gods in the Greek lore and culture, bad things are going to happen to you. So they're just doing what this culture seems to think they should do. And Paul points them, saying, no, we're not immortal. There's one God. And they continued in verses 15 to 20 to preach about this one God, this God of heaven and earth. So culture engagement and seeing that wherever we go, people are coming to faith. Jesus' followers Worshiping the one true God of heaven and earth. And uh, 
We wish we would see all these, all these events unfolding and think, oh, it's just great and everybody's coming to faith. But again, challenges that they're faced. Um, in verses 19 and 20, we read, Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside of the city, thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derby. So, miraculously surviving persecution, they thought the guy was dead. Can you imagine if huge boulders, rocks were thrown at you in this way to kill you, and they leave the guy? Yeah, he's dead. And then, well, again, that's God working. He wasn't, God wasn't finished with, with Paul yet. And I can't even imagine uh, what that could have been like uh, or any horrible persecution where someone's trying to literally kill me in that horrific way. And so just think about all that's going on here and uh, the fearlessness they have to engage with the culture, to keep presenting the gospel, and all these ways that they're trying to communicate the gospel, the timeless gospel, in unique ways. And that's still our call today, right? We all have different thoughts, preferences, music, other things, but we always have to be engaged with that mindset of what will reach our community? How can we present uncompromising the timeless message of Jesus, the gospel of Jesus Christ, in a way and a method that will uh, reach them, that will speak to our world, that will say, uh, and will always seek to engage the culture uh, faithfully that will help them experience Jesus. So if we always have that lens, right, as a church, as followers of Jesus, how can we communicate this timeless truth in a culture that's changing rapidly before our eyes? Would we say, this ain't what I grew up with. I don't know. How do I? Well, that's why we got to have a missionary mindset, right, when we go out. And when, you, and when you're a friend that has a total different worldview, hopefully all your friends don't just think the same way you do. Hopefully you and I have friends that are outside of our even Christian circles, and we're, and we're searching, searching for that. I said, Lord, lead me to somebody that I might befriend that could be vastly different from me, but yet can I have in my heart, wow, okay, i got to understand how this culture thinks, <laughs> and how can I in love befriend and welcome? And how can we as a church and all that we do, everything from worship, Bible studies, activities, events, other things? How can we have that, that kind of mindset? I hope that we can remember uh, uh, mission field mentality. It's other countries, and we support that in places throughout the world, but it's right here too. It's, Wilsonville is a mission field, as is every city in every country. So again, okay, so outward, engage with the culture. Now inward, Thirdly, the church is edified and grows as disciples make disciples. And there's just, a, I think, a neat picture of the church and the care for one another um, at the end of chapter 14 um, in about verses uh, 21 through, through 28. And we see at the beginning of 21, 22, it says, They preached the good news in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. So they're there building up the church, uh, encouraging them. We know that the church is both, again, as I've said, it's both universal throughout the world and local, but we're connected to one another as God's family through faith in Jesus. And uh, I think about that, the, the community and church and uh, gathering together. It's, you know, we're living in such a culture, culture where it's, you've got choices for everything. And even the, the church, to use an old uh, Burger King phrase, uh, commercial phrase, you know, it's that, you know, and even in the church, it's have it your way, right? <laughs> if you want church this way, oh, go here. Or if you want church that way, oh, go here. You don't like this, well, then go here. And, and we can become this consumer-driven mentality even in, even in the church, but the church in Acts was what it was, and there weren't a lot of options in that early church. This is who you're with. You know, you can't choose your family, right? <laughs> you're stuck with who you're with. And that's good, right? Work things out. we got to be a family together. And uh, uh, made-up believers from that community, the local body of believers, uh, staying connected. And I want us to read this verse together. I uh, highlighted this verse in a, 
video that's uh, going to be debuted soon, right, Hillary? Tonight? Wasn't this the one? So we did a video that you'll see maybe next week. <laughs> okay, let's read it together. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching, Hebrews 10.25. And that's a reminder, we need to continue in that walk so that we stay, as, the, as those first apostles like Paul and Barnabas stayed with just that laser focus. It can easily, uh, and again, I'm taking my thunder from my video that Hillary created with us, but sometimes we can uh, waver and go off the rails, so to speak, but we need that focus, and this helps us to stay laser focused. And the church, is ha- the church has leaders, right? People that bear specific leadership responsibilities, we see here, and the elders and the leaders in the church. And we have elders and leaders here, our, which I'll call our church council, I, our, our voted on appointed leadership. And thank you for the leadership that many of you have shown over the years in leading as church. We need that. And that's the challenge, the burden, the privilege of shepherding, caring for one another. Um, biblical models of leaders who love and serve the church as representatives of Jesus. And, uh, you know, just, again, that call to continually be discipled, learning, growing, and making disciples, uh, receiving the good news of the gospel and being encouraged in that and remaining faithful even and especially in hardship. So what is the church? The people of God caring for one another, being and making disciples. And uh, it says that they did spend, in addition to all their outreach, in addition to all their Winning souls for Christ and going out in the areas. It says uh, um, at the end of chapter 14, it says, and they stayed there a long time with the disciples. Right? They spent a considerable time, another version says, with the disciples. And taking time to grow, to be disciples. And uh, we have many things that, even good things that we can fill our lives that can take us in all different directions. But just being, learning, growing, um, and uh, building one another up, and as, then we, as we're built up and strengthened, then we can go out into the world and have that confidence, have that Holy Spirit-empowered confidence to go out and bear witness to the hope that is within us. As we close in prayer, I want you to think about a few questions with me that uh, I pray that you'd pray about this week and, and think about, and including the one I didn't put in here, but who's somebody outside of your circle of faith and even friendship that God might put in your path that you would befriend and love and, and that as God enables you, bring a good news of Jesus too. So, first question, how, how should or how can the church reflect Jesus himself when it comes to living by the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, going out in mission to our culture and creating a discipling culture in the church? How is the gospel our foundation for life in the church and the world? So just reflect on that. Think about that. Secondly, how can we help each other have fresh eyes when it comes to engaging our culture with the gospel of Jesus? I'd love to hear. How can we do this in in unique ways uh, that are faithful to the the gospel but reaching out in love? And then thirdly, pray that God would shape us into a truly spirit-reliant church. Right? Our own abilities only go so far, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, multiplied. So as we pray...